pick up with our summer series here, the snapshots from a spiritual journey. And today we want to talk about how to eliminate stress in your life. All right, I'm going to ask a question here. It involves your participation. How many here either currently have or sometimes in the past had some stress in your life? Raise your hand. All right, good job. All right, now there's two kinds of people in the world. The kind of people who get stressed, and then there are those who didn't raise their hand. They're the kind that give the stress. All right, there are two kinds of people. All right, I, I want to talk about stress for, a, for just a moment. Stress, you know, my wife gave me stress deliberately. She did. She worked for a cardiac office, and she put me into a stress test to stress my heart. Okay, so I'm on that thing. I'm, of course, I couldn't go as long as she did. She worked out every day, and I didn't, and, and so she still puts it in my face that, that she went longer than I did. But, but I went on that thing, and man, the whole idea is to put a lot of pressure and tension, stress on you physically so that then they could measure how your heart is doing, both when you're relaxed and then when you have high stress and, 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 and what's going on in your heart. But besides physical stress, there's emotional stress. The emotional stress, things cause you uh, more often than not to worry, to have anxiety, to bite your nails and fret, okay? And so we have those. Uh, and so sometimes the physical stress comes in ways of, of uh, actually your, your health. Uh, there's different ways that stress attacks us. Um, there's a spiritual stress when, when you're, you're confronted with the word and you look into the perfect law of liberty and you see what you are and you say, I just don't measure up and I'm stressed out that I'm not what I should be, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, there's parental stress. I'm not the, the parent that I should be and I'm all stressed out over that or there's a child stress. The standard's so high I can't make it and we're just stressed out. We got all this pressure in our lives. I, I think everyone, if they're honest, has experienced stress at some point in their lives. The key to the dealing with your stress is you've got to identify the source of the stress. The source of the stress. Every stress is triggered by something. Yet I notice I never have stress in my sleep. <laughs> I'm just not aware of what's going on. I mean, I'm like zoned out. And uh, I'm one of those fortunate people, you turn off the light switch and I'm asleep before the light goes out, honestly. I just fall asleep really fast. But when you're asleep, I mean, that's the way you can avoid the stress of your life. Just go to sleep. Just rest. But you've got to identify the source, the source that's stressing you out. Now, family can be a source of stress. I find that in our passage today. I pick up at the second verse, and it says, after Moses had sent away his wife. A wife can be a source of stress. His wife is a poor. And his father-in-laws can be a source of stress. When uh, couples want to be married, I take them through a, a, a workbook. I really don't do it. They do it. And, and it asks all the areas. It asks questions about all the areas of life that cause problems in a marriage. So when the people have done the workbook, they've already worked themselves way through all the problem areas of their marriage before they're married. Good idea, huh? So then when it arises in your marriage, you say, oh, I can't blame another person. I knew exactly what I was getting into. <laughs> you see, one of the sections is on in-laws. In-laws cause stress on a marriage. They do. And it works both ways. You see, not only did I inherit in-law, I became an in-law. The, the, the day I got a father-in-law, I became a son-in-law. You see, it works both ways. You know, in-laws. And also, he says, he sent her back to, to uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, along with the two sons. Listen, your kids can be a source of stress. Amen? Anybody raise their hand and say, oh, yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. There were a few times my, my parents were stressed out over their perfect child. <laughs> and my brothers would say, well, that wasn't me. That must have been them, the perfect one, you know. Um, but family can be very stressful. And we all know that. Also, the next thing I notice in the text is success can be a source of, of stress. Success. Not just failure, 
but success. Now, I say that because Jethro, the priest of the Midianites, a Midian, Moses' father-in-law heard all that God had done for Moses. Notice that. All that God had done for Moses. I go a little bit further and it says, and they went into the tent and Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians and the Israel, for the Israelites' sake and all the hardships that, they, that had beset them on the way. As we looked at last time, how Amalek came out and battled against them. He said, all, all, but he says, and how the Lord delivered them. All the success that he was experiencing. And Jethro replied, uh, he rejoiced for all the good the Lord had done. A preacher's nightmare is when you, you have a really good sermon one week, you know, I got to do better than that the next. <laughs> Well, when you hit some milestone and you say, what is there after that? I've got to do better than that. I don't know how I'm going to do better than that. You, you have this pressure. How am I going to repeat that? Two times I've gone to churches that were in financial crisis and uh, had to work on getting the finances straightened around and come back. And both times we, we launched a, a, a campaign to increase the funds that and uh, both times I called it Operation Heart Share. It was giving above and beyond your normal giving. And both times it turned everything around. And, and I, I can remember the year after we would do that, because it was a one-year program, uh, that was then confronted with, now what do I do? How can I top that? And it's that pressure that comes from success. Jethro says, ah, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. And Jethro's father-in-law brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. He said, man, I've seen what God has done. And, and the pressure is on Moses. How do I top what has already been done? That's stress. I've got to be better yet. You see, work can be a source of stress. Work can be a source of stress. The next day, Moses sat as judge. You know, Joyce and Alex, they know what it's like to have stress from the courts. Am I right? Oh, yeah. They work in the court system. <clears throat> Moses was the judge. He was the administrator. Uh, he was the jury. He, he was all of it. No, 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 listen. This guy's success had taken him from taking care of the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law, what do you have? Maybe 100, 200? I mean, if it was a big, big flock. 500 sheep? I don't know. He is now leading 2 million people. And he is the sole judge. You see, God is king. Moses is God's representative of earth. And he's got 2 million people that got questions for God and got conflict in their life that need to be resolved and want God to do it. And so he sat as judge with the, for the people while the people stood around him morning to evening. Uh, Moses, the judge's work was never done. <laughs> never done. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around from morning until evening. He's saying, man, your job is killing you. Do you ever feel like that? My job is killing me. I got to get out of this place if it's the last thing I ever do. Because <laughs> the job is just killing me. And, and that's exactly where Moses is at. A source, see, a source for stress in your life it can be your family, it can be your success, it can be your job, it can be your work, but it can also be yourself. He asked him, what are you doing? And he says, listen, Moses said to his father-in-law, oh, because the people come to me. The indispensable me. They need me. This job would not go on without me. And we all get to that place where the whole world would cave in if I was gone. I'm, I'm, here, I'm going to tell you, newsflash. If you're gone tomorrow, somebody will step into your shoes. They'll step right in. 
He says here, uh, Moses, he said just, Moses, because the people come to me to inquire of God. They got a question, they got a dispute, they come to me. <clears throat> and when they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of the Lord. I become my own source of stress because I don't set up boundaries and say, this is it, this is all I will do. I have to set up good biblical boundaries for my own health sake. Criticism can be a source of stress. How many here like to be criticized? Oh, no hands went up. Imagine that. <clears throat> Now, when you are criticized, like Moses is criticized, Moses' father-in-law says to him, <clears throat> what you are doing is, <clears throat> is not good. Sometimes somebody comes to us and they've got really good info and, and, and insight and constructive criticism and they share it gently and then we get up our defensive shields and protection of I'm in, indispensable and I got to do this thing. And, and, and we resist and fight back. And the person says, oh, I better not give them any criticism because they can't take it. I'll just let them fail. He said, what you are doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out. Both you and the people with you. For the task is too heavy. Talk about stress. This is pressure that's coming down. And you ever feel like that? It's just pushing you right into the ground. The pressure, the load. He says, you cannot do it alone. Which brings us then to discovering the solution. The solution here is you can't do it alone. He says, listen, the solution can be that you need some good counsel. Counsel can be the solution. Now listen to me, I will give you counsel and God be with you. He's not saying you set God aside. But sometimes God uses a counselor to guide and direct you. Here, God was using Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, to instruct him on how to run a nation and all he had been was a shepherd his whole life. But he said, you know, people are a lot like sheep. I gotta organize my sheep. I gotta you know, get some hands out there. I got my sheep dogs and, you know, I got, I got to get this thing organized. And, and so he, he's relating people to sheep and, and he's saying, listen, listen to my counsel. And he said, now, now, if it agrees with what God says. I believe in counseling. The Bible says in a multitude of counselors, much wisdom. You need one, more than one opinion on most things. And, and I believe in counseling and, and I took counseling training from a, a J. Adams Nuthetic Confrontation Counseling where we don't just listen, we give good advice this whole life. Biblical advice. I'm a biblical counselor. And if it's a spiritual problem, we deal with that. And if it's that, well, then I send you to whoever it is. Okay, you, you need a medical doctor. I can't help, help you uh, with that. You need a medical doctor and that kind of thing. <clears throat> but in the process of counseling, the, the Nuthetic Counseling, it comes to the word noose, mind. Thetic place. You place in mind, you give counsel, you tell somebody a solution to their problem. First, you've got to listen or observe the problem. That's what Jethro did. He first saw what was going on and said, listen, from what I'm observing, I'm about to give you some advice. I'm going to place in your mind a solution to your problem, so if you do it, it should solve your problem. That's biblical counseling. You see what is wrong, and you say, wait, look, and here's some Bible verses. This is the way it should be. You do this in your life. If you'll just do what the Bible says, your life will be transformed. You'll wind up with peace instead of stress. It's called neuthetic, confrontation counseling. Delegation is also a solution, or it can be. He said, you should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases before God. He said, listen, don't, don't stop your connection with God. That's really important. But you're going to have to hand off some of your responsibilities. You're going to have to delegate some responsibilities. Moses, you're doing too much. 
Most of us feel like we're the indispensable person because, well, if it's going to be done right, I got to do it, you know? And he's saying, no, you don't, don't, don't. Here's, here's what you do. Your delegation has to consist of, it's got to involve doing some things. You're going to have to go into a training program. He says, teach them the statutes, instructions, and make known to them the way they are to go and the things that they are to do. So he said, listen, you've got to teach some people, some leaders, to do what you are doing so that you can delegate to them, pass on to them the baton of some of the tasks that you're doing. We're in the Olympics right now. Could you imagine in, in, in the relay race when a guy's running and he goes to pass on and says, nope, I think I can do the next lap myself. <laughs> I don't want to take that time to slow down the hand off. I'm just going to do it myself and he runs the next time around. Oh, then this third time around, the guy's ready to take it. Oh, no, no, I got it. And he keeps running. What happens? He wears out. All the other teams got fresh runners. Zoom, 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 going right by. Here's the whole principle. I've got to delegate. Now, I need other people who are trained to run the race. Whatever it is that is stressing me in my life, I've got to find people to tra who are trained to help me with that. And if not, I've got to teach them to take over and share the burden. He says, you've got to enable people. You should also look for able men among the people. You've got to look for people who are able to do the job. Not just everyone can do the job. I was sharing with a friend of mine whose father had passed a year ago or two years ago. And uh, I was saying, you know, I worked for your dad when I was in seminary. He was a carpenter. And, and, he, and he said to I said, as a seminary student, he said, man, he said, first day on the job, he said, whoa, you don't know the difference your presence makes around here. He said, he said, we were working in an office. He said, yesterday, all the women in this place were swearing like sailors. They were cursing like sailors. He said, but I told them, hey, tomorrow we're having a seminary student in. And, and uh, he said, I haven't heard one bad, foul word out of any mouth today. <laughs> now that you're here, well, they're all on their best behavior. And so I worked with him, and, um, and he gave me projects to do, and I wasn't quite, they weren't just coming out quite as nice as this professional carpenter who was helping, you know, one of the seminary kids in the church to make, make a living. And uh, a year later, uh, during that year, I spoke at church, and uh, afterward he came up to me and said, you need to stick with preaching. <laughs> You need to stick with preaching. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a pretty handy guy, but I wasn't able to do the task that they were doing. I needed far more training than just a rookie. And so he's saying, you've got you to train people who are able to do the task. Listen, we have some tasks here at the church that need to be done, and we need people who are willing to be trained and are able to do them. We have a tech team. We want to get a worship band together. I have no musical abilities, Okay. I do a little bit of art, but I don't have any music, so I need you to do that. We need technical people, and, you say, and we'll train you. You just got to say, hey. People say, I don't want to do it all alone. No, we don't want to. We want to have teams to do this. And so we're looking for those kind of people here at church. He says, you got to have qualified people. That's the next important part. They're trained, they're able, he said, but they have to be qualified. Men who fear God. I'm a little concerned about uh, our country's courts because I don't believe that all the, all, all the courts and all the, all the judges fear God. Fear God. The Word of God. The Word of God. Congress, during Reagan's administration, referred to the Bible as the Word of God. They don't do that at all today. Our nation is just sliding. That why they don't fear God. We need qualified judges, just as they had then. Uh, he said, next thing they have, you have to do is you have to have entrusting people. You, you, you've got to have trustworthy people. People that you can actually put trust and confidence and know that they will do the job. He says, well, this is what you need. You're going to delegate responsibilities. Ethical people. They hate dishonest gain. I don't know if they're corrupt before they get there, but it seems like everyone who goes to Washington comes out corrupt. General observation, stereotypical, I'm sorry, but it just seems that way to me. 
We need honest people where honesty is the best policy. He's saying, if you're going to have judges, they've got to be honest. He goes on and he says, you've got to organize this thing. Set such men, these kind of men, trained, enabled, qualified, ethical, organized. He says, set them up over, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. He's worked right down to ten people in the nation. So there's a way to work your way up in a court system so that Moses winds up being the Supreme Court because really he just goes before God who is the Supreme Judge. And God spoke to Moses. Finally, he says, you've got to be discerning in all this. Let them sit as judges. Don't do it alone, Moses. Discerning. You, you let go of the responsibility. Yeah, you could probably do it. Let them do their job. Let them use their discernment for all the people all the time. Let them bring every important case to you, but let them decide every minor case. Let them do the minor. And when they say, oh, I'm stumped on this one. Guess what? I'm going to take this one up to my boss, and the boss takes it to the boss, and then the boss. Uh, Moses, could you take this one to the real boss? And they're organized to accomplish the mission. Delegation is so important. Now, identify the source, and then you start looking at the solutions. you got to experience the end of stress. And the end of stress, he says, if you do this, Jethro says, just do it. We can talk about it all day. You can make your plans to be successful at work all day, but if you don't implement the plan. You can make a plan to throw off your stress, but if you don't implement the plan, you're not going to have the result. And so God, he says, if you do this, and and God so commands, is is in agreement with the will of God then you will be able to endure and all the people will go to their homes in peace. Not just you, Moses. All the people will have less stress because you as the leader have less stress. Everyone will have more peace. The end of stress comes, it says, so Moses did just that. The next verse like a checklist. He listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from Israel. He appointed them as head over all the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. It goes on and it says he eliminates his stress. He says, and they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses. But any minor case, they decided themselves. Then Moses's, Moses let his father-in-law depart. And he went off to his own country. God brought Jethro at that time in his life to be the counselor to solve the problem. And Moses listened. Then he hearkened, he did what he hurt. He just did it. This is what I want you to take away with you today. You need to identify your stress's cause. What is it that is stressing me? What is it? Then you've got to find a solution. Here's three possible ways. Find a good counselor, a Christian counselor. A Christian counselor that's really using the Bible and not just a secular counselor who throws a verse on, but a counselor that opens up the Word of God and explains this is what it means and this is how you're supposed to live your life. And, and then you've got to do it. You have to implement the plan for change in your life and it will reduce your stress. The Word of God will reduce your stress. But in the end, you, you still got to just do it. <laughs> You've got to do what the Word of God says. Because when you don't, you step into stress. When you do, you step into the blessing of God. Choice really comes down to you. What will I do? I'm suggesting you just do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that you have 
only the best intentions for our lives. We know that you want us to have a peace that passes all understanding. You want us to have tranquility in the midst of a storm. You want us to have a stress-free life. And Lord, we're the ones who overload our lives with too much to do, too much pressure on ourselves, allow too much of the world to pressure us for the lack of our boundaries. And so today, Lord, enable us to do the things that will solve our problems, genuine solutions. And Lord, then taking the Bible and just doing it so that we can see the blessing of God in our lives and spill over with peace in other people's lives. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.